with newer LLMs coming out like OpenAI's O3 that is able to beat the performance of competitive programmers, is it even worth it investing in learning the lead code skill? In this video, I'm going to talk about how you can get better at lead coding, what strategies you can use to perform well on the interview itself because it is a skill, and finally, is it worth it to cheat on your lead code style interviews? So whether you're a beginner who's trying to get into lead coding or an experienced developer who is trying to switch jobs and therefore needs to embrace the lead code grind, this video has a little something for everybody. There are thousands upon thousands of lead code style questions, and a lot of them are very repetitive. They repeat the same pattern. So the first place that you want to start with is the blind list of 75 lead code questions. Speed running this list of 75 lead code questions is going to give you the exposure you need to all of the most common interview question patterns while giving you the exposure you need and practice you need through easy, medium, and hard lead code style problems. The link to this list of lead code problems is attached in the description below, and it it is perfectly fine to take your time going through this list. The first time you go through with this, you may not be able to cover all of the problems, but it is very, very important that you don't memorize any of the solutions. Remember, the key idea is to understand the patterns so that you can recognize them when you encounter them during an interview. And because most of these problems introduce new concepts, you are going to have to keep coming back to already solved problems to brush up on your understanding. Taking copious amounts of notes and space repetition are going to be your best friends. Next, I'm going to cover all of the most common and important data structures that you will be encountering in a lead code style interview. First of all, arrays and strings. These data structures are super easy to understand, but they cover 90% of all of the easy and medium lead code style problems you're going to be encountering. And that is because you may have to use some very tricky algorithms to solve a lot of string and array problems. Next up, we have hash maps and sets. Look, there are very few coding problems that cannot be solved using a hash map. In fact, most of the time, you're not going to be using a hash map to solve a coding problem is A, when the problem tells you you have to use a specific kind of data structure, or B, when the time or space complexity constraints of the problem don't allow you to use a hash map. Number three, stacks and queues. You have to understand stacks and queues really well because their understanding is going to set you up for two of the most common algorithms you're going to be encountering in coding interviews, aka depth first search and breadth first search. Number four, trees and graphs. Understanding trees and graphs can be a bit tricky, but if you're trying to crack a job at a fang tier level company, then you're going to have to get very familiar with these data structures. Number five, heaps and priority queues. Now listen, if you find yourself using a heap or a priority queue to solve a lead code style problem, congratulations, you have just encountered a hard lead code problem. And finally, linked lists and tries. God, I hate linked list problems so much. But the good news is they're not all that common, so you may not encounter them as often. But the bad news is when you encounter them, and you're tripped up by pointer management, you are going to have a bad time. <laughs> you're not gonna use any of these data structures on your actual job, bro. There's no point in learning any of this. You're wasting your time. Okay, true, you may have a point there, but here's my take on this. If you understand data structures and are able to use it to solve low-level puzzle-like problems, then even though that low-level puzzle solving skill itself is not going to help you on the actual job, but it is going to make you better at critical thinking and also doing high-level functions like system design, which are very, very valuable on the actual job itself. So yeah, don't sleep on lead code. All right, so those were all the data structures you need to be familiar with. Next, I'm going to cover all of the must-know algorithms that you need to have in the back pocket before you step into an interview. Number one, the sliding window algorithm. This is going to be very useful when solving certain problems that involve contiguous subarrays or continuous subarrays and substrings. Usually you want to use the sliding window approach when the brute force solution is not acceptable and you need an optimized solution. Another algorithm that is used when you want to find a more optimized solution is the two-pointer approach. A lot of different linked list problems can be solved using the two-pointer approach. And also when your array is sorted, you might be able to get away with using a two-pointer approach as well. Next up, we have recursion and backtracking. Recursion is when a function calls itself and you throw in backtracking when you want to explore a lot of different options by keeping memory of the function calls. Whenever your problem involves exploring multiple different choices involving permutations, sub 
subsets or decision trees, your mind should be itching to use recursion with backtracking. Number four, God, I hope this doesn't happen to you, but dynamic programming. Dynamic programming is something you should use when you can break a problem down into smaller problems, but not just smaller problems. These smaller problems or sub problems should be overlapping. Your mind should itch to use dynamic programming when you realize that a bigger problem can be broken down into smaller sub problems that come together to solve the bigger problem, but you notice that the same sub problems occur over and over again, AKA the problem has optimal substructure and overlapping sub problems. The pattern is hard to recognize, man. I'm sorry if you encounter a dynamic programming problem in your interview, just hope for the best. Number five, graph traversal using depth first search and breadth first search. BFS and DFS involves exploring a graph in a structured way by visiting its nodes. But the tricky thing is, not all problems that use BFS or DFS will necessarily start out with a graph. Number six, sorting and binary search. When the given input is already sorted or can be transformed into a sorted structure, think binary search. And finally, greedy algorithms. You should be greedy when making the best choice at your local step without looking forward is going to give you the optimal bigger solution. AKA, you should be greedy when local optimal decisions lead to a global optimal solution. Make sure you understand these different algorithms so that your lead code solving experience becomes one of pattern recognition instead of rote memorization. All right, now let's talk about what you can do to absolutely kill it during the interview itself. I'll tell you what the best interview taking tip is. Just use a tool to cheat on the interviews like Interview Coder. It doesn't show up on screen share, so it's virtually undetectable. There's an AI co-pilot that's going to whisper solutions in your ear, give you the problem-solving approach, and even write code for you. It does not get easier than this, man. Don't be dumb. Just do it the easy way. <sighs> okay, if you want to take that risk, be my friend. But let me do a risk assessment for you. The probability of you getting caught may be low. I mean, sure, the interviewer can't see this tool on your screen as you're using it, but if you don't keep your acts together, they may suspect you're up to something, which brings me to the severity of the risk. If the interviewer strongly suspects you're using a tool like this, they may put you on a blacklist for the company indefinitely. Plus, I've done plenty of coding interviews where the interviewer doesn't really write down a problem for you. They verbally communicate a problem to you and expect you to write out a coding solution. Anyway, if you do decide to not cheat on your lead code style interviews, here are some good interview taking strategies. Number one, Keep thinking out loud. You have to involve the interviewer in your thought process. At the end of the day, these coding interviews are not to see if you can solve a random coding problem given 30 minutes. It's to see how you approach problem solving. It's to see your thought process. And that means that it is not expected that the only thing that come out of your mouth is the fully fleshed out approach. You have to loop your interviewer into the thought process that brings up intermediate steps. In fact, one of the things that I like doing is I will share my complete approach with the interviewer and then ask them for their buy-in. I will ask them, hey, what do you think of this approach? If this seems like a sound approach, I can start coding it out. Number two, pattern recognition is great, but don't overfit your pattern recognition model. Take a breath and actually understand all of the parameters and constraints of the problem. Make sure to ask the interviewer questions that help you define the problem, understand all of the constraints, understand all of the edge cases before you start coming up with a solution. And when you do come up with an approach, think about it in terms of pseudocode first before you get to the coding. Number three, don't forget to also demonstrate your debugging skills. Your interview is not over the moment you write the last line for the coding solution. Take a sample input case and do a dry run of the problem using that input case, showing how that input gets manipulated it as it goes through your code to give you the output that is desired. In the process of doing this, if you find that there are bugs, then fix those bugs. If you find that some lines of code can be more optimized, then do those optimizations. And finally, practice doing time and space complexity analysis of coding solutions so that if you're asked about the time or space complexity, you are able to answer them correctly. So there you have it. Lead coding may not be the most fun activity. In fact, it may not even be a fair assessment of a software engineer's abilities, but it is very much much alive and kicking. In fact, your ability to solve lead code style problems may be the highest ROI skill that you have in your tool belt because of the salary bump you can be getting when you get a tech job or when you switch tech job. If you found that video helpful, please like, share, subscribe, and hit that bell icon notification, and I will see you in the next video.